Well, thank you so much, Lester, and, and thank you to everyone um, here um, at NZEI um, for an unbelievable welcome. I must say that each day I feel increasingly overwhelmed. Um, people have been incredibly kind. Um, we're learning so much. Um, you know, I, I, what I offer you today, I guess, is in the spirit of sharing and hoping it might trigger some things for you. Um, that it might connect with some questions you already have, that it might make you curious um, to find out more um, from other teachers and children. I am from um, Queensland University of Technology. I better just say that um, because you know my faculty would, would like me to say that. Um, you, know, you know how things are. Now, I do have a lot to share and in a way this, this talk is going to be in two parts. In the first part I want to give you a sense of how teachers and school principals in Australia have been grappling with the ethical questions that they face that are brought about um, through the introduction of NAPLAN. But I don't want to dwell there. I want to share what they say because I think, um, not because I want to um, say poor us, because I then want to go on to show what that grappling might lead to. Because while we wait for the revolution, you know, um, life goes on, right? Um, things are still happening. Meanwhile, if you like, in schools and classrooms. So I guess my talk is going to be very much about meanwhile, in schools and classrooms um, and staff rooms um, and board meetings and so on, life goes on. So, so let me begin and um, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and to say a very, very particular thank you um, to our Māori colleagues um, and I've just loved the singing. Before I start, one of the things, um, I was saying this to um, other folk the other day, one of the things that I notice, um, and I noticed this quite some time ago now, when I was working in a school, in a very high poverty school in South Australia, and I can remember one of the teachers saying to me, I worked in all the classrooms, and one of the teachers said to me, you won't learn much in there. Nothing very interesting goes on in there. Anyway, I'd only been in this classroom five minutes when the teacher put on the, um, her little recorder and, the, and brought the classroom to life with singing. And I think, you know, there could be more singing. You know, there could be a lot more singing. Um, and I am going to begin with a, with a little bit of talk about um, dance and singing. Um, and my overall topic then is ethical accountability, getting over the malaise and charting fresh directions in primary schooling. But if you notice the photo behind me there, I want to kind of take us back again, um, connect us back to um, schooling. And when I was in primary school in the 60s, we used to stand out in the hot Adelaide sun and march. Let's just do a hands up for who used to march. Hey, hey, right. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. And for some of you, of course, it would have been in the wind and the cold and the rain. Now, sometimes we just marched on the spot. Remember that? You know, that, that kind of did things. You know, I think some of my knee and back problems now, you know. <laughs> so, you know, from my perspective as a child, it was a form of torture. And for the teachers, it certainly meant we burnt off all that excess energy. And they hoped, I think, that it taught us a form of discipline. So I'm not sure what I hated more, marching on the spot or marching in a circle. <laughs> or indeed, marching around the school grounds. In either case, we did not move forward. And not surprisingly, I guess, given the military history of marching, it frequently invokes competition and indeed conflict. But of course, there's other kind of marching, um, you know, incredibly important marching in history associated with music and of course, solidarity. Um, and I guess I want to invoke that spirit here. You know, when students in America and South Africa and many other places walked out of their schools. So I wanted to begin then with this evocative image, and I'm sure many of you who are old enough have got something similar, um, that would take us back a bit historically. And also I want to signal a little bit of scepticism about moving forward, even as I embrace the need for optimism. And of course, Bob, non-stupid optimism, not radical dumb. 
So marching, marking time and meanwhile in schools and communities, this is where I'm headed. Let's hope I can get this to work. Um, it would appear not. Ah, hey, success. Okay, so this is probably my one theoretical slide and I'm just going to use it to make a point. So Popkowitz said some time ago, he contested the common sense view that educational reform, germs or otherwise, we equals progress or that change is for the better. And he warned us that a discourse of progress is fundamental to pedagogic thought, but reform is related, and we've heard so much about this this morning, to patterns of social reg regulation found in schooling. Now, as an eternal optimist, as I think you'll come to see, I want to embrace the idea of moving forward, but I want to be wary of reform, change, and progress as intrinsically good in themselves. I'm going backwards now. Moving forward. <laughs> okay, help. Stuck. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have action. Oh no, it's back again. It has a life of its own. I swear I'm only pressing forward. It's upside down. Okay. Now, let me just go back one. You are going, if you can't see, you will need to move in this presentation because if I can ever get the PowerPoint to work, there will be a lot to look at. One of the other things I want to say about moving forward, and I'll just do a hands up in a moment. How many people know who Julia Gillard is? Hey, hey, cool. So how many people know that moving forward was Julia Gillard's mantra? Okay, now it's important that you understand this. It's also important that you know that um, I am not, in fact, I am in many ways a supporter of Julia. But I want us to just enjoy the whole, and to think about before I try and move forward, ha, um, moving forward. Move forward, Julia Gillard, Janice's Forward, forward, go back. Forward, downwards, we'll bounce. Forward, forward, forward. Under my leadership, we'll move forward. Forward, go back. Forward, downwards, we'll bounce. Forward, forward, forward. So now the crowd joins in. Okay, um, so in case you, you know, worried that um, I might be a supporter of our current government, hmm, um, we could talk about that all day, I hasten to add that I would much prefer to move forward with Julia than stop with Tony. <laughs> and, um, you know, who just has always wanted to share the pain. And I was very taken by the cartoon of um, Alan Moyer, who's a New Zealand um, cartoonist, and if you can't see it, it says the pain will need to be shared between the jobless childcare workers, old age carers and teachers. Which I think is kind of very much of um, where we got to yesterday about, about really understanding that what we're experiencing in education in terms of audit cultures um, and so on is, is, is not just about education. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, my work is really about literacy education, social justice and teachers' work. Now, I kind of have to have a little plea for literacy here, a little plea for literacy, because it's become a kind of a dirty word. And, you know, that is so sad, because some of us have fought for many, many decades about the politics of literacy, about inclusive literacy, and about critical literacy. And I remember Bob and I wrote a paper, an article some years ago, where we, we worried about what might happen if literacy became too important. 
and if measurable literacy came to count as literacy. So I just want to give you that little bit of background. Um, but what I've always tried to, to look at is what literacy education might do. Were it well done? Were it multi-literacies? Were it multilingual? Were it really taking into account what different people bring to the classroom? So this is what I'm going to argue, and I'm going to take you to classrooms very quickly. So I'm going to argue that mandated literacy assessment does indeed reorganise educators' work, and it does it translocally. It does it in classrooms in, um, in Davram Park in South Australia and in West End in, in, um, in um, Brisbane. But what I'm going to argue is that what mandated literacy assessment does and what makes it incredibly dangerous is it has different effects in different places. And you, many of you will already know that and experience that. For some, it's business as usual because the kids already know that. Benchmarks are not an issue. And for others, it transforms their work. But nevertheless, I'm going to argue and I'm going to show you, and they're not necessarily blow you away cases. They're actually quite small, everyday practices that teachers and principals can and do devise ethical, context-specific practices. And that's what we're always trying to do. That's what we're trying to imagine as, as we listen to each other here at this conference. And that coalitions of university and school educators can research together. And I'm, I'm a huge advocate for teacher research. And I'm so excited that you even have the word inquiry in your national curriculum. Soon we won't even have a national curriculum. You know, um, that's another story. But that we can research together ways of redesigning creative, critical and just educational spaces and that that can be part of ethical accountability. So that's the argument. I'm going to draw on three projects. One, um, mandated literacy assessment and the reorganisation of teachers' work, which was an institutional ethnography conducted in Canada, Victoria and South Australia. And I'm only going to take examples today from South Australia, but my point is we were looking at what this phenomenon did in different places, internationally and across states and across schools. A current project which is called Educational Leadership and Turnaround Literacy Pedagogy. And I'm going to draw very much in the final part of the talk of a, pro of a project that was um, funded by the union as well as the Department of Education in South Australia called New Literacy Demands in the Middle Years, Learning from Design Exper Experiments, where the design experiments, action research inquiry was conducted by teachers. And there I'm going to focus very much on critical literacy in place. So I want to argue for an expanded view of literacy across the curriculum. So I'm going to start with the problems, turn to questions of ethical action, and then think about charting some fresh directions and talk a little bit about what I see as the malaise and how to get out of that space. I'm not going to read this out to you, but the overall research design of the project that I just mentioned was um, to explain what the lived experience of teachers was in terms of recent reforms in assessment and reporting. What did this feel like? What did this change? So we know so much from the research about big picture change, about narrowing the curriculum and so on. I wanted to try and see what was this like in the context of people who were just learning, just experiencing NAPLAN for the first time before it became a taken for granted part of our everyday lives and practices. And what difference did it make if you were in a high um, SES area, a low SES area, if you had a multicultural community in your, in your school, if you had a lot of Aboriginal children in your school, if you had new arrivals, was mandated literacy assessment the same everywhere? And of course, you'll know the answer to that. Okay, and importantly, how do these practices impact on the classroom experiences and literacy achievement of different students? That's always my question. What does this do for different kids and what do different kids do with this? What do different kids make of what's going on? What does that add up to for them? What will their graduate profile consist of? Now, I'm not going to expect you to read all of this. I'm going, I want to draw your attention to, um, to what happened in two schools. The two schools I'm going to talk about are Water, 
Well Primary School, which was a highly multicultural school in inner Adelaide, also high poverty. And the other school I'm going to talk about is a rural school, Wheatville Primary School. So I'm just going to talk about two schools. We, in fact, worked in, um, in around 20. Now, this is the principal talking from the, the high, highly multicultural school in urban Adelaide. And she's reflecting on the fact that she, and she's a really good girl principal. She wants to do the right thing. And I mean that in the best sense. She wants to do the right thing by the department. She wants to do the right thing by her teachers. And she wants to do the right thing by kids and families. You know, she's truly a very committed person, probably like, you know, the people in this room. And she's reflecting on the fact that she used to, because she thought it was the right thing to do, they used to, as she puts it, we included everybody in their dog in that plan. So they did, not, they did not game the system. They did not exclude their new arrival students. They did not exclude their children who were on um, NEPs. They did not exclude their Indigenous children from that plan the first year it was done. They thought, we will all do this and then we'll learn from it. And she comes back from a meeting and she said, well, we did that because we, the previous statewide one didn't seem to be particularly punitive or judgmental. But then she said, and she'd come back from this meeting, it was made very clear at the end of last year that this is the data that counts in the conversation, that it's practically the be-all and the end-all. They say it's not, but it is. And so we ask, counts for what? And she says, how successful you are at teaching. Okay? The, this is a test of children. How successful you are at teaching. And the assistant principal says, and this school. Oh, and student achievement. And she goes on and she says, Julia Gillard makes no bones about the fact that NAPLAN is the, school way, the, the way schools will be judged. And she continues to um, say um, that the CEO of the department the regional directors, the local minister. So she talks her way down through the layers, say they make no doubt about it, this is the data that counts. Okay, so that's the short and very gruesome story, in fact, of, um, of her experience. So in 2008, this was Waterworld's data. What you need to know is that, is that red is bad. So just to go back. This is Waterworld's year three, five, and seven data. At the end of that year, they were declared a failing school. Okay. I'm going to tell you this story very, in a very quick fashion, but if anyone wants to know the nuts and bolts of it later, I have written about it. I'm happy to chat with you about it. Now, she made some, some really interesting decisions. Um, and she came back to this, and she's reporting what she said, and she's in the staff meeting, and she said, and I came back and I said, this is it, this is everything. And I said to staff, you know, we've got to lift our NAP plan up. And they complained, the staff, and they said, yeah, but that's because we put all our kids in, whereas other schools remove their Indigenous kids, they remove their kids on NEPs and they remove their new arrivals. And so when they were compared with like schools, they look fine. Okay, so this is what happens in a system when people um, are asked to, um, it's the performativity um, word again, when people are compared with each other. So compared to other categories two schools, which is like your low decile schools, it looked like we were failing. So we were classed as a siler. There's even a word for it. There's even a name for it. They became a siler because we were a failing school. And she said to the teachers, we now have to teach to the NAP plan. Now, I've told you at the beginning a little bit about her, so I don't want you to think she's just sold out. But she does report that, and she says, well, some of them think we've just sold out. But she also says, but they are so cooperative that they all do it. Well, I think they do. She starts to worry then. Maybe they're not all doing it. Maybe they're secretly doing something else. You know, teachers do continue to secretly do all sorts of things, don't they? <laughs> Hands up, those of you who are secretly doing things you shouldn't be. There wouldn't be anyone in the room who doesn't secretly do something. If it was phonics was out, you'd be doing phonics, or if you know what I'm saying here. Whatever, you, you buck the trends because you go for balance. Okay, so she says, you know, we have the year-level meetings, and I won't expect you to read that, but her point to me in this interview is that we teach the kids to deconstruct NAPLAN. We are teaching them the politics of the text and how the text works. Now, this is her best go at this. 
not saying other people should do it, but this is her response to the situation. And she and the assistant principal tell us a little bit more about how they do that. And they do it at the level of discourse and they do it right down to the level of the, of the physical layout and the multiple choice and so on. And she says, if you don't warm them up to that, the disadvantaged kids, well, probably any kid really, just don't get, you don't get the best results for the child because they can miss that bubble over there. So there's all this test literacy which she says, okay, we have to do it, we're gonna do it properly. And she teaches them how to do it. And I have to say too, in this school, I actually saw them explain to the kids the politics of NAPLAN and what it meant and how their schools would be compared and so on. So they took it seriously and made it part of the learning. This is 2009. Now, what has she done? She's done all that explicit teaching. She's removed the children who have been in Australia for less than a year and are still learning English. She's removed the children who are on negotiated education plans for a whole variety of reasons, but usually intellectual um, disabilities. And she's removed some of the Indigenous children in consultation with every single Indigenous parent who actually made the decision about whether they would sit the NAP plan or not. Now you think about how much work that is, quite apart from anything else about the ethics or your own judgment or what you would have done differently. Think about how much work that is. From being a siler, they became a star. Other schools were invited to come and see them. I mean, no, this is it's a funny story in a way, but it's also a tragic story. It's also a tragic story. Um, Okay, now this is the teacher, or one of a number of teachers. We had a number of focus groups. We watched also in these classrooms. I haven't got time to share all, all of that with you today. We watched the, kids, uh, the teachers explicitly teaching the kids how to deconstruct the test um, and so on. Here I really want to reflect on this because it's a key theme that I want to come to. This is the teacher talking about what she sees as the negative effects of it. And she says, I've got a kid He's, he's really badly, his grades have just gone, and then she does a sound effects down this year. And I've spent time talking to the counsellor and that's coming in to support this kid. And the counsellor said, said to me, have you done this and have you done that? And I've gone, well, actually I normally would have done those things, but the pressure this year was so great to meet the requirements for the SILA and the NAPLAN, and SILA was a result of NAPLAN, that I actually couldn't do any of those things. So what is really worrying about this is this teacher is an experienced, competent, ethical teacher. And the thing she knows about how to reconnect a kid who's been disengaged are forgotten. The kind of the panic produces a professional amnesia. So she says, I couldn't cover the things, the social learning stuff, and I think that's really important that these kids need because I wasn't meeting my 300 plus minutes of literacy a week and I wasn't matching the description of accelerated literacy and I wasn't covering the reading program and I wasn't teaching them how to do the test. Okay, so you get the picture, right? So this is, this is the kind of how this teacher feels. Um, this has positioned her and she said, and I haven't taught, and she's most upset about this, and I haven't taught visual arts all year on the grounds that, well, shit, there's nowhere to put it. Sorry, you can delete that. Okay, um, and I'm not going to spend as long as I could on this because I do want to move forward. Um, but one of the, we, I'll just give you a sense of a few of the things that really stuck in teachers' throats, if you like. And this is a teacher, um, he's a year, six te a year five teacher and the thing that stuck in his throat, and I don't know if you know about NAPLAN, but the teachers have to administer the test. So not only do the schools have to do it, they ha the teachers actually have to administer it. The school has to be set up in a way that kids can't copy off each other, da 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 da. You can imagine what that means in composite classes, etc. Um, and where some kids are doing it, some kids aren't. You've got year three, four, you've got year threes to five in together. There's all sorts of issues. Anyway, the thing that stuck in this teacher's throat, quite literally, is reading the script to his class, reading the instructions. Teachers must, the following test. And he starts to verbalize this even as he explains it. Can you now, please make sure you answer all the questions. And now turn back to the test, to the practice questions. And he puts on a different voice even as he talks to us. And, and I, as I was reading to my kids, blah, blah, blah. And the ESL teacher said, yeah, because that's not how you teach. And one of the things that um, the teachers have found incredibly difficult 
is that this changes the rules, the interactional rules. You are not allowed to help the children. You are only allowed to read this script. And so this, and he says it incredibly powerfully, and he says, it was, as a student, this kind of raises your anxiety level even more because there's this voice, this authoritative voice coming through this piece of paper that was not the way my classroom teacher speaks to me. So, you get the message. Now, you know, what is this? So you can see this has already created huge anxieties and work, etc., for the principal, created anxieties and fears and feelings of inadequacy in the teachers. What does it do? What are the teachers report that it does with kids? Just very, very quickly, um, an upper primary teacher said, yeah, it's pretty bad for some kids who have worked really, really hard. I had a couple of kids who worked really, really hard and they came a long way. And we were talking about this, their movement. And then they get the test and they see this, a little black dot sitting underneath the line. Okay? Because that's how the NAP plan reports to parents. So the kids are shown you know, where they sit in terms of the national average. And that's what goes home to parents and that's what parents have to explain to kids. Anyway, you know, the teachers talked a lot to, to us about what they did to try and mediate that, to try and reinterpret it. And the bottom line here is the teachers um, saying to the parents to worry about it later when they got older because I think it's just not measuring their true abilities of English anyway. Try not to pay attention to their grid having to you know, send home a report to parents that you actually don't think represents what's going on. Very, very troubling. Now, briefly, um, because of time, I want to turn to a different school. One of the things that happened in that school was that the principal had, all, had, was, had a highly developed understanding of literacy herself. She'd done a master's in literacy. She had a whole school program. She had highly theorised um, accounts of what it was she was doing. She had invested enormously in teachers' professional development, and they were able to turn that around, you, despite all the other uh, side effects. Okay, they were able to turn around their scores. I want to take you now to a small rural school, also high poverty, and I'm only going to give you a, an instance of, of what was said here, but I want to show. There's disadvantage and there's disadvantage, right? There's poverty and there's poverty. And policies enter the lives of schools and teachers and parents and families at different points in a school's um, process. And that makes a huge difference. So that principal was able to call on a lot of knowledge. This is a different principal who's been in this particular rural school for quite some time. And he says, one of the things that the process did when he was judged as being a principal of a failing school was to open a door for me to be part of the Principals as Literacy Leaders project. Open a door. I want you to notice his language. My keenness was to try, let me just see. Oh, I've missed something. I needed to give you the context. Um, just to give you the context, um, very low um, individual incomes, household incomes and family incomes compared with Australia the Australian averages. And when we first asked the principal if he would talk to us, he, this is the way he talked about it, and I, I do need you to see this because it's very different than the previous principal in terms of what resources he calls upon. I would welcome more skilling of myself to be able to unpack the mandated tests. I'm happy to administer them because I think they give some direction to programming. But whether it's a good direction or token or whatever is dependent on how well we unpack it, drill down. I guess I'm crying out for some help in that area. So as you've already seen, there was some help. Um, he was able to participate if he went to Adelaide in the Principals as Literacy Leaders project that was offered for some time to build principals' knowledge of literacy. And then he said, I'm keen my keenness was to try and get some outside influence, particularly with the year three to seven group. So it was another opportunity for them to consider how they're going about things. And then notice the language change. As a school, we've zeroed in. So he's opening doors and going out and outside influences. But as a school, we've zeroed in on reading this term because you know, all of the reasons he gives, while some of our kids are below national benchmark in reading and writing, that reading is where we've got most of our resources. That's where we've got some key people on staff. And then go to broad literacy later. 
And he doesn't want to water stuff down, but he does say we wanted to go narrower and deeper. And one of the things, I'll tell you the short story of this, this particular principle invested hugely in a reading scheme. You may know it, Lexiles. Spent enormous amounts of money on Lexiles. And the reason I mention this, I'm not wanting to evaluate a program here or talk about the pros and cons of Lexiles or, or anything like that, but it was a desire on the part of this principal to, to resource his teachers, to have something there that would help them. But this is a very different principle than one, one we've just met who's got a very strong theory about literacy and language learning. So he is crying out for help. And once he's been to his you know, dose of principles as literacy leaders, he's got to come back and make it work. He's not going to get more resources. He's got to find ways of spending the resources he had. And this is a teacher's response. I'll let you read this while I have a, a sip of water. Um, but this is a teacher's response to being assessed as a failing school. There were some people that came to our school. You know, who are these people? I don't know if they're the equivalent of your ERO. But some people came to our school and interviewed every one of us. And it really made me feel under pressure and like it was questioning my performance as a teacher and my abilities. And it made me feel quite low and flat. And they go on to talk about, I felt that they were very quite intrusive and not really assisting us at all. They were more critical and judging and not sympathetic to the scenarios that we were working with. That's one teacher's experience. Now, I want to not just think about the teacher's experience here, and I don't want to go, oh, isn't this awful? I want to think about what does this do? What does this do to what's made available to these principals, to these teachers and to these children? What's the upshot? What's the so what about this? So one of the really dangerous, and this is the malaise, if you like, in my title, one of the really dangerous things about NAPLAN in Australian schools and in high poverty schools is that if, if you leave the schools with a definition of failure, you can actually um, then very, very fast track back to deficit in terms of how they think about their children and their families. This is a conversation in a focus group, year three teacher saying, you know, the, the malaise is um, the government blames the school system and, of course, teacher educators, us radical lefties, um, for doing such a lousy job of chaining the teachers in the first place. So the government blames um, the universities, the school systems, the principals, the principal brain blames the teachers. You know, that's why he wanted to get some outside influence because it's really, you know, the teachers he's stuck with. You know, he's got to do something to fix them. And then, of course, what's the obvious next step? Well, it can't be the, princ it can't be the principal's fault. It can't be, you know. So, you know, the, the malaise here is the blame game. So back to deficit. Here we go. When you think in t of that in terms of literacy, I mean, what's literate about their parents? What's in their homes that supports literacy? We've all heard this. I have worked my entire working life against this talk. I wish I could just obliterate it, hit that delete button. Um, you know, how are they spending their money? As if it's our business. You know, they're not really poor because I saw them down the street. You know, you've heard these things. How is it valued? Do they get a newspaper? Can they afford that? What do they do? Do they tune into the television? Do they read a book at night time? Maybe you've overheard some of these conversations in your staff room, heaven forbid. How to get their attention and keep it. So here we, we've had the families of the problem, now we get the kids of the problem. How to get them involved in what's going on. Do they, the parents, do they actually understand what their children are doing? Are they at school? Good question. You know, why would you want to come there? It doesn't sound that welcoming, right? Um, okay, so you can see how quickly this goes. And then the teacher right at the bottom saying, you know, we're a low category school. They wear it like a badge of honour. I mean, we said before, it's no big surprise when we get the NAPLAN stuff back. So this is dangerous as well. And a lot of my work is, is very much influenced by, by Michel Foucault um, and the idea that everything is dangerous. You know, we need to think about um, power as productive. So here, here we very quickly go to they, we, and these kids and I don't want to labour it. 
but the teachers uh, understand that that review unit wants them to be better than we are, um, and we aspire to be better than we are, but for those low category schools, when those results come back, um, and if they start using it in a much wider community-based publications or whatever, this area is a low achiever. Don't send them there. So what, where this goes and what is happening in South Australia and Australia more broadly because we have so much private education is we have people pulling their kids out of schools on the basis of my school and so on. That is actually happening. Okay, so I said I wouldn't dwell on the negative. So I'm going to summarise. Um, but I also don't want to paint a completely bleak, bleak case around this. So mandated literacy assessment has a range of consequences. For teachers, de-skilling, cynicism about change, alienation, loss of time, loss of authority, loss of professional autonomy, loss of respect, loss of creative spaces, which I'm going to come back to, and sometimes loss of judgment. I haven't shared it with you today, but then there's the teachers that send the NAPLAN stuff home to practice. You know. And then, of course, you can go into our post offices. I was telling Meg Maguire or into our supermarkets and buy NAPLAN light tests for your kids to practice on. And teachers also photocopy them and send them home. Okay, for principals, the negatives, more paperwork, more public accounting, more need to market their schools. The positives, more curriculum and pedagogy focused curriculum learning opportunities for them. The principals as literacy leaders wasn't all bad. The idea that principals would build their own knowledge is a good one. Seems fine. For students, early performance stress, earlier official comparisons, positives, explicit teaching of skills, assessment literacies, practising tests. Some teachers finding out that if they explicitly taught kids how to do things, they could do them, lo and behold. For parents, um, and I won't go there today, but you know, we heard a lot of stories about managing stress in children, comparisons between siblings, and homework intensification, where the problem is shafted home to these families, who if only they'd got it right in the first place and lived in the right suburb would have, and read those kids their books would have been fine. Okay, on the positive side, earlier and ongoing identification of difficulties. As a former secondary school English teacher and remedial reading teacher, one of the things it did is to say to teachers in high schools, hey, we still need to teach these kids and help these kids learn to read and write in our subject areas. We can't take it for granted. So that, you know, that was on the positive side. It's a pretty short list, but that's okay. Now, in the time that I have now, I want, I want to move to, um, I've done the problem, I hope, and you kind of know it anyway, you experience it. I hope I've given you a sense of how some teachers experience it. I hope I've signalled the major risk, and the major risk of this, from my point of view, is back to deficit, is the blame game. Because, you know, that becomes, we know what that does, and we have to work really, really hard against that. So in other work that I've done with Barbara Kamler, and I'm not going to talk about this project in any detail now, but I just want to summarise it because it underpins some of um, what comes later. We developed the idea of what we've called turnaround pedagogies. Um, and you know, so much of what I heard this morning from Margie and her colleagues you know, is what we were trying to do in our work in highly multicultural, high poverty schools in Australia. And one of the things that I want to argue is that and I'm so pleased that you already have the space for this in your inquiry, teaching as inquiry, is that one of the ways we can fight against deficit and raise our expectations for all kids and develop creative and critical curriculum, make spaces for it, is, is to think about us all becoming researchers in our own right. And of course, that's got major implications um, for teachers' work. When, how, with what resources, major um, implications. So, that, you know, I'm so pleased there are so many folks from the union and why I work with the union at home, is that if we really want teachers to be um, inquirers, researchers, we need to think about how they go about their work. We need to think about what's the data that really counts, that makes a difference to how we teach kids. So in that book, which you can buy, and I can advertise it because I don't get any royalties, they go to the Primary English Teaching Association, 
Barbara Kamler and I wrote with teacher researchers about this notion of turnaround pedagogies. And this is what we argued. I'm going to summarise this and then I'm going to show you some examples of it. We argued that for their part, teachers, and I'm including principals here, educators, need to engage with theory. Theories of social justice. Theories of cultural capital. We need to understand what, the, what that, those poverty statistics for New Zealand mean. We need to deal with material poverty without going back to deficit and judgmental stuff. We do need to take that on board. We need to understand what literacy is and how it's changing and not offer our kids in disadvantaged schools some minimalist version of literacy. We need to offer them a complex, sophisticated repertoire of practice. And this is you know, key here, and I'm going to share the work of some teacher researchers with you in a moment. Teachers need to read research and do it. You know, in any other profession, the professionals are reading about research in their area. I get so frustrated when I put the news on and some young um, medical researcher has discovered yet another cure for cancer. There are so many that I don't know how anyone, you know, suffers from it anymore. Because every night on my news in my country is, you know, some, somebody's discovered something. But I never switch on the TV and find out what, does kids, what teachers are discovering about their children and what's going on. Or very rarely, good news stories in the media are few and far between, and they tend to be about heroic individuals who achieved against the odds. So reading research and doing it, fundamental and in the centre, parents in dialogue all the time. Communities and their circumstances, not being a drive-by teacher. You drive in, you do the job, you drive out. You fear the community. So what does it mean to really understand the community? And I was so excited this morning when um, you talked, a number of you talked about the importance of observing students in different contexts. You know, a learner in one situation can look entirely different in another. The little boy who did the drawing down the bottom here, um, is, is his story is written about in the Turnaround Pedagogies book, and it was only when the teacher watched that child learning in different contexts, on the school camp, um, on the playground, you just watch an illiteracy lesson and you can see not much going on for some kids. You watch that child use language in another situation and you can see an entirely different kid. And most importantly um, for our role as teachers, whatever our practice, we constantly need to be examining the effects of our practice on different students. That's the really key thing about assessment. You know, if I do this critical literacy approach or I do jolly phonics, what are the different kids doing with that? It's not about whether one is good or bad or whatever. We could have those debates. But they're a distraction. What we really need to see is what the kids are doing with what's being put on offer. Okay, transition. I want to take you to a project that I'm still engaged in at the moment. Um, and it's a project about educational leadership and turnaround literacy pedagogy. And we're working in four schools. What they have in common is that they're all poor. They have different communities that they're serving. And the schools that we're working with were schools that were previously identified as failing schools and then participated in a program called SILA. And we're now going into those schools where they have changed their data the big data and the little data, the data that counts for the, um, for the department, but they've also changed the school culture. And we're going into those schools and we're trying to find out what does this look like to grapple with being declared a failing school, with trying to turn around what's going on here, trying to build respect with communities. What do teachers and principals do? in these places. And I'm going to share just some information, and it's very brief today, about um, the work in one school, which is the school where I'm hanging out. And I've now spent a year there, and um, when I go back to South Australia next, I'll be going in and working um, in this school community again. Now, I want to make two kinds of points. Quite apart from whatever else is happening, what I want to argue is that pedagogy, 
Teaching and learning in any classroom is accomplished jointly by the teacher and the children. It's a joint accomplishment, and you know when it's not happening because you're not both doing it. You're not working on it together. You know, those kids are somewhere else. So, and one of the ways that pedagogy gets done, whether you use accelerated literacy or jolly phonics or whole language or... The pedagogy actually gets done in the conversation, in the talk. That's why that teacher felt so upset when he had to read out those tests. Because he knows that every time we talk to kids or young people, we send a message about who they are as learners and as people, who they are and who they might become and how they learn. So we're always sending messages, whether we're conscious of it or not. So as teacher researchers, we need to be thinking about the everyday micro practices. How do we address them? You know, are they in um, the square group or the koalas or, you know, give me some help here. You know, what group are they in? Do we talk to the kids? How do we address them? Because the kids are knowing and the parents are knowing. So the messages teachers give young people, and I would include principles about who they are, who they can be, and what they can do and should do. And I want to argue that no matter what else happens, it's, we have openings, we have spaces of freedom in the way we talk to people in our everyday encounters. Every single encounter is an opportunity to show children respect or not. Okay, so I want to make that point really strongly. On the other hand, you know, we also want to join the revolution. We want ambitious large scale and long term change. There's some genuine reform that can test deficit talk and low expectations. I'm sure that's why most of us are here. We do want to think about curriculum design, and it sounds, and my brief look at your curriculums is, opens up wonderful spaces for local negotiation of pedagogy and learning. We do want to build teacher knowledge. We do want to foster cultures of critical inquiry, and that is all contingent upon us connecting with communities. Now, I'm going to now give you some examples of from this one school. The school that I'm working in is one of, in one of the poorest areas of Australia, urban areas of Australia. It's um, you know, on the scale, it's off the scale, if that makes sense to you. It's an area that, you, that people don't choose to live in, but it's an area with a lot of public housing and it's got a fairly high um, population change. Now, the school where I'm working, um, the principal had been appointed to the school um, and he'd been there for, I think, a year and a half before I arrived. And he was a principal with a reputation. I think we're going to hear some news on some of this later today, but he was a principal, not about him, but about your principals and change and so on. But he was a principal who had a history of working in tough schools and changing the learning culture. So he was deliberately appointed to this school. And what I've been doing is trying to find out what he does, okay? And he keeps saying to me, I don't want you to be thinking that this is some kind of exemplar. This is a work in progress. And I think that's interesting because aren't schools always a work in progress? You know, they always have to be negotiated because you can't take anything for granted. New kids, new families, new teachers and so on. Anyway, the short story is that a number of things have been done and most of them um, are not surprising and I'm not going to talk about them all here but the principal has worked very hard to get some good news stories in his local newspaper and also not to be... So he's worked really hard on that and I just want to give you two examples of what he does. Um, and then, I'll, and then I'll move on to take you into one classroom with an early career teacher. I think it's also incredibly important if we think about the teacher workforce and, again, the union. Who are our workforce? How old are they? What cultural and linguistic um, resources? ..is that he is incredibly good at sharing leadership. But when things get a role, you know how something happens in a school, a problem emerges, and then somebody will suggest a solution. And then before you know it, everybody says, yeah, let's do that. 
Well, in this school, the problem was about the kids not getting to school on time. How many of you share that? Okay. You know, whose fault is that? Okay, so the kids are not getting to school on time, and so it went like wildfire in a staff meeting where one of the deputy principals, one of the assistant principals said, let's have an assembly, let's have all the parents and the kids at the assembly. We're talking, you know, 650, but then you add the parents, so maybe you get 800. Let's have them all outside, not marching, but standing in the shed. I want you to understand the physicality of this. This is the idea. Let's have an assembly and let's tell them about our new times. I'm sure you're all thinking about how that might go down. <laughs> you're all already anticipating um, the problems. Anyway, apparently this idea went like wildfire amongst the school and you know, the principal said to me, usually you know, if things are a good idea, he lets people run with it. He asked them to try and imagine what this might do and how that assembly and telling the, the parents who'd be there, of course, not anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so what they did in, the, in that case is he did intervene and he asked the teachers to imagine these scenarios. Now, you, this takes time. This takes a lot of time because you're dealing with people's assumptions about how you can change behaviour. This is incredibly... This is really where the rubber hits the road, right? It's about behaviour. Um, so anyway, the short story on that one is what they negotiated is a weekly um, news program which would be presented by the children, filmed by the children and sent home. Okay, so it's like watching the news and I, I didn't have time to download that and bring it for you today but this is an amazing thing. So the children are having opportunities to become the news readers, to tell the news stories and so on. A good news story. One other example and then I'll move to the teacher's classroom. One of the difficulties in these kinds of schools, and again I'll ask for a show of hands, is actually getting a staff that stays and having some continuity. Recruiting people who want to be there. Is this an issue for you and your schools? I don't know. Maybe not. It is an issue in this school, recruiting people who want to be there. So not long ago, um, a young teacher who was not long out of her, um, not long graduated, um, was on a short-term contract for a term in the school and at the end of her first week posted on her um, Facebook page that various comments about working with the ferals. Okay? Now, again, I mention this story because if this is not happening in your school, congratulations. But this is the kind of work that a principal and all of us need to do all the time. It is about how this can become endemic. So this young woman's contract finished rather quickly. Um, however, it's out there, right? It's out there. So let me move on. The school is a work in progress. So just to summarise what I've learnt from this principal... He problematises the whole notion of school success and failure. He won't buy into it. It's, for him, it's always about, OK, where are we? What have we accomplished? What's next? What are we working on? What's next? When he went there, the problems with behaviour meant that um, the office was apparently, you know, never... It was always full of kids being sent there for their misbehaviour. So they had to work really hard on that. Taking hard decisions prioritising resources, changing the school culture, long-term project. He's worked incredibly hard on building community capacity. So we don't have your boards, but we have governing council. And he's worked really hard to build the capacity on governing council so that that's not just a rubber stamping of decisions he's made, but that the people are coming on there and actually having a say about their children's education. He's engaged in the strategic recruitment of knowledgeable and willing teachers. Five minutes. OK. So let me move very quickly then. These are a range of things that he's done. But he's met, in terms of the resources, let me give you one example. He now has an assistant principal literacy improvement. You might hate the title, but what this woman does, and she's an incredibly experienced, skillful teacher, is she actually works with each of the individual teachers on how they're enacting the school's literacy agreements by having literacy chats, one-on-one -on -one chats. She gives them opportunities to observe each other and customises the school's literacy resources. Big deal. Now, 
I don't have time to dwell on this because I do want to leave you with the voices of children and I've taken my time. But in the classroom of an early career teacher who is achieving fantastic results by all measures, including running records and including kids' writing, one of the things that we're noticing is that the discourse of the school has moved from a focus on behaviour and deficit to a focus on learning. Surprise, surprise. And in listening to this young teacher in all her lessons, the word that comes through no matter what subject area, no matter what time of the day, is to remind the children all the time about their learning. And she does that in a very understated way. And she's constantly telling the kids when she doesn't think she's got their best. This is the small micro every day of teaching that actually, in my view, makes a huge difference. Now, because I've been given my marching orders, um, I want to turn then to some examples of what I think are, are some very exciting practices um, developed by in conjunction with teacher researchers. And I want to make the argument that, you know, those of us in universities listen to, need to listen a hell of a lot more to those of you who work in schools. And we all together need to do a hell of a lot better documentation of what's being accomplished in schools. Because if we don't document what we're accomplishing, then we put ourselves at risk of somebody else documenting it in different ways, with different grids. Okay, um, I won't have time to show you um, all that I wanted to show you, but I want to make a case that literacy doesn't have to be all bad, that it also um, can be incredibly empowering depending on how we understand it. And the teachers that we've been working with are critical readers of the curriculum. They're always looking for those spaces, the spaces that Margie mentioned. They're always looking for those spaces to think about their work. So they've actively used the cross-curriculum priorities of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, sustainability, and so on. Now, they might not be using them much longer, as Bob knows, because the, you know, the current federal government is threatening to remove these. And in case anyone is interested, um, I brought the most dreadful thing from the Australian where one piece of analysis they had done was um, to count how many times the words Aboriginal and Indigenous were used in comparison to ANZAC um, in our national curriculum. I mean, this is the kind of journalism we are working against. <clears throat> okay, this is a story I won't tell you, but I have written about it because I want to leave this with the voices of children. But in a school community with teacher researchers, the teachers have made place the subject of curriculum. And it's in an area of urban renewal. I'm just going to show you the pictures. They've thought about with the children the whole idea of the school as a belonging place. And they've made it the subject of study in their classroom by positioning children as researchers. This is one teacher's curriculum plan, setting the scene, living windows, talking walls, growing grounds. And they're probably similar to many of the things that you're doing in your inquiries and your locally based curriculum. The students have actively become researchers out in the community. They're learning to observe. They're learning to interview. They're learning to report back to their peers. They're actually learning to question the spatial politics of everyday life even writing to their principal about the drama space being in the new school not being sufficient for them to do the learning that they need to do. This is the kind of proper critical literacy that we'd all want for our kids. And as their teacher says, the students became the ones with the knowledge. What if we had knowledge producing schools where the kids were part of that? Um, and the children were learning their literacy by doing this and observing what was going on. The gym has changed slightly. It has a yellow, furry, soft thing. It's called insulation. This is how it's pronounced. Sorry, I wanted to share that with you. I am a year four. My favourite place is the basketball court because all my friends go and play with me. I like shooting hoops, but... I, I wish I had time to share that, but the curriculum is based around the notion of belonging 
And so the kids put together not only individual texts but whole class texts. And then they report back on what they're learning at the whole school assemblies and so on. This term, our topic is about interviews. We're becoming journalists. I mean, I love that idea of the graduate profiles. What are our, who are our kids becoming? What are they assembling? Now, I've been given my marching orders, so I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with the voices of children. Um, to give you a context, this is an amazing, wonderful teacher researcher who's a, an ESL teacher and a filmmaker. And that's the other thing. What are the resources our teachers have? Are we making the best use of the repertoires of practice that we have as educators? The teacher is working in a new arrivals situation um, and what she does is position all children. In this case, it's, um, you'll see that it's particular groups of children. She positions children as researchers. Um, and I just, if I can, if you bear with me, and then we, I will stop, show you two little bits um, beginning with what is the largest country in the continent of Africa. Does anyone have an answer, by the way? Mm, we'll leave you with that. Let's, let's, let's see some of this. Anyone got the answer yet? I wanted to show, oh, no, go back. <laughs> Stop and go back. Okay, now, I would have, if we had more time, I would have loved to have shown you more. If you're interested, you know, I can show you at lunchtime or whatever. But I want to show you now what happens next. I'm going to skip a little bit. But what does happen next, and I have been told to shut up. Um, I'm not talking, the children will talk. What happens next <laughs> is that these kids from the Sudan become the roving reporters in their school asking questions, and I'm just going to show you one snippet, and I am actually going to go and sit down. Okay, so. What do you know about slurs? What? What do you know about Sudan? countries around the Sudan and the Red Sea. Ten years ago I was born in Khartoum and I went to Bor and I went to Ethiopia and I went to Kenya and I went to South Africa because of war. We were in Khartoum, then we walked along with the airplane, we came to the Bor. Then, then we went, we, we came across here, we went to the Ethiopia, then we stayed stay for the little one, then we went to Kenya. My point in leaving you with that is what can happen if you position all children wherever they're at in their learning as researchers and give all kids the chance to be expert um, amongst their peers. Thank you so much. <laughs>